morning, period three. Um, well, something I've really missed doing is, besides missing you guys so much, is actually calling roll. So today I'm gonna actually call roll for your start of your video. So good morning, Esmeralda. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Vivian. Good morning, Seabass. Good morning, Zoe. Good morning, Andrea. Good morning, Francisco. Good morning, Anthony. Good morning, Max. Good morning, Alex. Good morning, Leslie. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Andrea. Good <clears throat> morning, Vanessa. Good morning, Adam. Good morning, Nicholas Herrera. Good morning, Brianna. Good morning, Micah. Hey, Bailey. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Janetsi. Good morning, Giovanna. Good morning, Jazz. Good morning, Lily. Good morning, Sammy. Good morning, Jasmine. Good morning, Karen. Good morning, Fernando. Good morning, Caitlin. Good morning, Joelle. Good morning, Madeline. Good morning, Isaac. Good morning, Kiana. Good morning, Judith. Owen, are you eating your food again? Good morning, Owen. So your dad brought you food, I see. All right. Well, so we're going to start off with chapter 22. 22 is a little bit about um, sexual relationships or sexual reproduction um, and just some other the differences with um, <clears throat> um, different types of relationships, symbiotic relationships, whether it's good, bad, and different. So in this video, I'm actually going to show you other random things throughout my house or throughout the video, say things that you're going to have to catch and actually answer when you answer the questions or write me the little th blurb on my video. That way I know you read it, you actually watched it. And each period is going to have different ones. That's why I actually called your role for this period three. So um, symbiotic relationships. Um, that's when you have different species that are going to benefit from the relationship that they have. So they might, um, some can be, one can be beneficial and the other one's not, or they're both beneficial or, and one can be beneficial, but the other one isn't harmed. So those are some of the things that are going to go on. So we're going to know that this is going to be a symbiotic or a symbiosis relationship. Um, a relationship between same species is going to be an intraspecific relationship. Are you in a relationship? Mm, yeah, probably in some sort. We're all in some sort of relationship or another, whether it's our friendships, our relationships with our parents, or maybe you have a girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever. Um, so uh, obviously in a relationship where one is going to benefit and the other isn't affected, the other person or the other species is not affected, is going to be called commensalism. And it occurs a lot with sharks and little fish. So you see the little fishies going around and swimming right by the sharks. And they're going to catch all the food um, that the shark kind of leaves behind. So what did my dog Luna just do? Question number one, that is random. Mm. Yeah, hopefully I'm sure you heard. Um, so up oh, there, she does it again. So the fish is going to be protected from the predators because of the shark, and then it's going to have the benefit, but it doesn't do any harm to the shark for being there. Um, some of the other marine critters that have relationships are going to be like sponges and crabs and the crabs and the worms and some other invertebrates that actually live within the sponge. So they don't hurt the sponge at all, but they're protected from other things and they, um, and but the sponge just kind of goes about its day and eats and does whatever it's going to do so but when both species are going to benefit from the relationship it's called mutualism so that's what you kind of want in your relationships is uh, you want it to be mutual you don't want one being doing more than the other and you kind of want what's going on um <clears throat> so that relationship is actually going to be a, give your species a better chance of survival so I'm actually going to kind of walk you around the house a little bit um, and I might show you something that you might have to answer about. So on this wall, I actually have a pretty good saying here. So in a perfect world, every dog would have a home and in every home, every would have a dog. So that might be something I ask you about. So just so you guys know that it's going to be a little bit different. Hopefully I make it a little bit goofy. Um, so in the very deep parts of the ocean, near the thermal vents, the entire ecosystem is going to be a mutualistic relationship. So there is a giant tube worm and the bacteria that lives within that worm. And um, because we know that there's no sunlight down there, obviously, um, there is the way they actually are able to create food is with this bacteria. Um, so when the bacteria is is going through it's called chemother chemosynthesis i'm stuttering a little bit because this one right here is wanting attention yeah 
Isn't he cute? There he is. Ha! <laughs> um, yeah, he's like moving my arm around. So um, all around that giant tube will be like crabs and shrimp and other fish and clams. Um, and they actually have a whole food section. See, now he's climbing up on me. Um, they have a whole food section that is able to survive because of the chemosynthesis. Um, in a symbiotic relationship where one species is harmed and one is benefit, oh, that got bright, um, it's going to be known as parasitism. So a parasite is going to need a host. So the host could be whatever fish or whatever other organism is there. Um, and so the... Uh, it was just going to be the most common. This is going to be the most common types of different relationships that are in the ocean. Um, one of the common ones is going to be an isopod parasitic that's attached to a squirrel fish. An isopod is also part of like the um, lobsters and crabs um, that are there. Um, they're all part of that crustaceans. And the isopods are... Um, some of the largest crustaceans, very diverse, so they can live pretty much everywhere. They, they're they part of ones that live deep down the ocean. And deep down the ocean, they can get up to like 20 inches. Wow, that's pretty big. 20 inches, almost two feet. So parasites can live on or in um, a host. So we actually have parasites in our stomach sometimes when we get really sick. Um, like if you're going to Mexico and drinking the water or going to a place that's not doesn't have filtered water and it has parasites in their water, you can get really, really sick from that, um, Giardia. And so you need to be careful. Um, so, but like <clears throat> parasites, they, um, they can live in us or in marine animals for long periods of time and they have really no effect on us until we get stressed out or we get sick and then they can cause a lot of other um, problems. And the scientists actually think that for every fish that's out there, there's about three or four different parasite, parasite, parasite worms species. That's a lot of different species of worms. Um, so when the fish that are, in sell, are sold in the markets, they actually are checked for parasites and worms to make sure that they're not transferred to you because if they did, you kind of get really sick. And now we're gonna move on to coevolution. So this is when a species competes or cooperates with each other to develop a trait that actually helps the other one. So because of the reaction from the other species, a trait is developed. Oh, there's Andy. Say hi, Andy. Hey, everybody. <laughs> um, Andy's my roommate. Um, so they actually have developed traits to be able to survive and have a better chance of survival. One of the most popular ways that we know about this, or the one that we mostly hear about, everyone knows who Nemo is, and Nemo lives where? He lives within the poisonous sea anemone, right? Well, how can he live there? Well, because of the coevolution, um, clownfish have actually developed a mucus on the outside of their bodies. So they are actually able to... Um, they don't, when they stings, it doesn't sting them because they got stung so many times. Kind of like some people do with like snake venom. Um, so they kind of, they want to make, or bee stings or when someone's allergic to something, sometimes they want to try to keep having little bits of it to try to build up a immunity to it. Kind of like we need to do when we get a flu or vaccine or um, think about the COVID going on. So if we can build up an immunity to it, we won't necessarily get it or hopefully we don't get as sick. Um, another an example of coevolution is predator and prey. So a predator is going to, when they're chasing a big school of fish, they're going to catch those the slowest one, right? Pretty much. Yeah. Um, so what happens is that group of fish ends up becoming faster to be, to become, um, not able to be eaten as quickly or they're to try not to be eaten, obviously, because they don't want to be prey. Um, so another thing, so what happens is the predator then becomes faster because they have to become faster to catch their prey. And then, so that's a coevolution because the fish are now becoming, or the prey is becoming faster and then the predator ends up becoming faster. So it's that vicious cycle continues around and around and around and around and around. All right, reproduction, mm, kind of interesting. 
the marine animals really kind of surprised me. Some of the things that they can do. Pretty crazy, amazing. Um, if they don't need a partner to reproduce, it's going to be, they can reproduce asexually. So they're asexual. Just like plants, like sponges and, or plants in the ocean, plants on, on the uh, earth, they kind of reproduce the same way. <clears throat> um, sponges have like little buds that break off and they're going to be exactly. So if it's being asexual reproduced, their, um, their, re, their reproduction, their species, their offspring are going to be the exact same as the parent. So they're going to have everything exactly the same. Good thing about this is it happens very quickly. Bad thing is it there's no diversity. So if something happens, they don't have a way to weed it out. They don't have a way to um, have any diversity within their um, genetics because they're all the same. Because they are asexually reproduced. And sexual reproduction is actually, well, how we're reproduced. So you actually need a sperm and an egg. And our offspring has half traits from mom, half traits from dad. And then um, this allows for a faster evolution. So this is, can be actually, but it takes longer for the reproduction to occur. Um, there are some species that are pretty cool because they can kind of go between asexual or sexual, depending on what's going on. Or within their life cycle, they go from asexual to sexual. Jellyfish, <clears throat> pretty cool. And they actually, depending on where they are in their life cycle, will actually be um, shift between asexual and sexual. Um, and then there's a lot of species that are actually able to reproduce both sexually and asexually, like a sponge. A sponge can do it either way. They can either have the little buds, which is going to be asexual, or they can release their eggs and their sperm and in the water and hope that they get fertilized, um, which is a little more challenging, but we learned in a different chapter that they actually learned how to time that out so it actually happens more often. Um, uh, <clears throat> so one of those is going to be called a sessile, is a type of sponge that does that. Um, also, the star coral do, do the same thing. They release millions of sperm and eggs, and that's going to be called spawning. Um, and so once they connect, they can fuse together and they start to reproduce that way. A lot of times, though, during the mass spawning, the fish have actually figured this out, that they actually go in, they eat a lot of the larva or some of the other, um, will feast on the eggs and the sperm, depending on what's there. So mass reproduction happens with other animals, kind of like turtles, um, <clears throat> fish, squid, clams. So the parents don't spend a lot of time, if a parent doesn't spend a lot of time in either taking care of the child or um, spending a lot of time with the reproduction part of it, then they're gonna, re they're gonna have a very high level or very high mass reproduction. And so there we have a turtle that I painted. Uh, yeah, kinda cool, huh? I like it. Hopefully you got to see it. Um, so if the parents don't spend a lot of time, then they're gonna have, as I say, a high mass of reproduction because they need to try to ensure that their species is continued. Correct? Yeah. We already kind of learned that about turtles. They'll lay about, what, 300 eggs within their reproduction period? Hey, Luna, stop it. Um, and then there are some species like the flatworm that are hermaphrodites. So they're not either one. And they actually fight to become the male because the females actually have to become, sorry, he's messing with me. Um, the females have to carry the eggs, so they actually fight to become the male, so they don't have to carry the eggs. See, this is him. He likes to, he wants to be part of our lecture. Your butt, you need to get down now. Um, and some species can change sex to accommodate the reproduction. <clears throat> so if there are too many males, then they'll become female. If there are too many females, then they'll become male. So depending on what it is, that's needed, <clears throat> that's what they will become. This actually happens, ouch! Um, sorry, he bit me. Stop, stop it. Um, they, a lot of the reef fish will do this. And so whatever gender, and then some genders are actually dependent on the temperature that we know that that happens with turtles. So we know that, that when that happens, they'll just change depending on the temperature of the water. Mollusk will change depending on, on who's on top of them. So a mollusk is kind of like a clam. Ah, stop it. 
that they will oh um they will attach to a rock and then they will um go on top of each other and so whichever one the one starts on the bottom is going to start off as a male and as soon as the one on top goes on top the one on the bottom becomes then a female and they will do stacks of this so that they'll actually kind of change depending on which one's on top <clears throat> um, so it's kind of interesting that they can actually do that it's amazing what our what our natural habitats are and what our what our nature can do um, to be able to survive and what happens down in the ocean so what but when a parent does spend a lot of time with their um, offspring they'll have fewer babies because they have a higher chance for survival um, so one of them is the Adelaide penguins <clears throat> they spend a lot of time together with their um, nurturing or keeping their their eggs warm um, they have they have one parent that stays on the egg and then another parent that goes out and gets food and then they actually mate they have one mate for life um, and so they are very very careful uh, to make sure that their babies are taken care of and then they spend time with them once they're born to make sure that they're strong enough to be able to survive on their own um, male seahorses are very kind of interesting because once the woman is pregnant and she's getting ready to lay her eggs she actually deposits them into a male pouch and then the male pouch he doesn't give any nutrients or anything else he just is there for protection and i used to raise seahorses um or i used to have a lot of seahorses growing up and we noticed that when we kept the mom and the dad in the same tank once the dad released the seahorses or the seahorses um, hatched, the mom would actually go and eat them if we didn't separate her out. So we always had to bring her out to make sure that she didn't eat the offspring. Um, sharks. Shark females will lay eggs. Um, some develop internally, some develop externally. Some the ones that are external actually develop this really, really tough leather pouch. And they actually call it like a mermaid sack. That's pretty cool. And then they go and deposit it, and then once they leave it there, whatever happens, happens. They get hatched, they get hatched, they get eaten, they get eaten. Sorry. Um, and then some actually have them internal, and then when they're internal, then they give birth to live babies. Um, and But some of them, like the tiger shark, <clears throat> what happens is some, they actually start their predatory um, adventure like it, within the womb of the mom that if one hatches or one's there and when they are there they actually go and they seek out the other ones and they start eating them inside before they get born some of them do that with the eggs too so if they hatched earlier than the, their brothers or sisters or whatever they'll actually go and eat them before they actually get hatched um the pinnipeds the cetaceans serenians and polar bears provide the most parental care Blue whales, um, gestation, there's gestation's about a year. So they actually spend a lot of time with their child and developing that. That's actually longer than what we have. Um, and then they spend about another six months nursing that little baby. And that little calf can actually gain about 250 pounds a day for the first six months. Pretty crazy. And then they about seven to 10 years before they actually reach sexual maturity. So I hope you enjoyed this. Got a little different, um, got a little had Luna in here, had some other things going on. So pay attention to the little details. Have a great day. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Bye.